Live the Sky Life with my MTN Sky Premium Contract Packages designed to suit your needs, usage and lifestyle. Enjoy exclusive benefits and signature experiences on a MyMTN Sky Bronze plan and get 30 gigs of anytime data, 1,600 all-net minutes, 400 SMSs, and Hello World Roaming, or for just 839 per month. Sign up or upgrade today. Pop into a local MTN store or visit mtn.co.za. T's and C's apply. What are we doing today? MTN. 702. News and current affairs. 13 minutes after 10 o'clock, President, uh, former President Thabo Mbeki says that the ANC has betrayed its original mission. Uh, and he really focuses his scathing attack um, on the issue around Palapala and the protection of the president in all of this. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as we continue uh, in this conversation. Dr. Pedro Mzileni is the author of a, uh, uh, a very, very insightful column in uh, the uh, Sowetan, uh, uh, over, oh, yeah, in the Sowetan uh, today, and he joins me now on the line, Professor Mzileni. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Good evening to you and also to listeners of Radio Seven Two. So the president wrote this letter. Um, some people have suggested that it is really a matter of wanting to hop back to the provisions of the Zondo Commission um, that spoke of cater deployment and all of those kinds of issues. Some people think it's a matter of principle that the president, former president wrote this letter to uh, Mr. Paul Mashatile. What is the reason for this letter by President Tabombeke beyond what we see in front of us, uh, Mr. Mzeleni? Okay, Um, I would speak assuming that um, people have read the letter and um, I would also assume that people have also read the the opinion piece that I wrote for the Sovetan this morning. Some some may not have. Yeah, Yeah. so I'm going to expand um, a bit more on on the article. So... President Mbegi's uh, main target in the letter is how the ANC today interprets the role of parliament. And um, as you would know that um, South Africa as a state is not quite old. It was only established in 1910 as the Union of uh, of South Africa. This was uh, an agreement between the British colonizers and also the Afrikaners at the time. And Parliament during that period, at least from 1910 up until 1994, it was used as an instrument to pass violent legislations to to dispossess uh, black people, but also to systematically kill them, destroy them, take property from them, uh, reduce them to cheap labor, give them poor education and so on. So basically parliament was the instrument of uh, the highest degree of evil uh, against against the black people. And the ANC after 94, when it took power, it made a, a significant uh, contribution in changing the purpose of parliament from what it was being used for by the apartheid regime. The ANC said um, parliament now needs to become the voice of all South Africans, especially the poor, the voiceless, and those who are least remembered. And two, uh, parliament needs to exercise oversight now over the executive and state organs to ensure that constitutional and statutory obligations are properly executed. In other words, Parliament after 94 would be an irreplaceable feature of good governance in South Africa. And this is such a a strong antithesis from what Parliament was being used for under apartheid. Now it was used as a productive democratic institution to build people uh, to give voice to the people, in essence, for people to govern themselves. Yeah. 
Now, he says in the letter, this fundamental principle of this institution of parliament is now being grossly violated by leaders, firstly, who know nothing about the history of this parliament, who know nothing about the history of the ANC itself and its intellectual contributions in crafting parliament and what should be its purpose. Instead, the ANC now is just using its majority to bulldoze its way through, even uh, removing responsibility it has of holding the executive accountable, especially the president, even when they do something wrong. So he says, the struggle was pursued on a high moral ground where we promised the people that we will hold everyone accountable, including our own. So if a president of the ANC does something wrong after 94, the ANC will be the first one on behalf of the people to hold that person accountable and remove them from power. So he's basically now saying the ANC has totally forgotten that, not only forgotten that, but actually the people presiding over government and the ANC and parliament have absolutely no clue about the post-94 constitution and its obligations. So it's quite a, a very strong, uh, brutal, and a gruesome and a frightening observation by Pre- President Beggy, and it's one of his best writings, uh, in my opinion, because I've been following his letters for the past five to ten years, and for me, this one stands out as one of the of the best writings uh, of our times, especially during this time that we're in. A 17-page document it is, the letter you refer to, uh, uh, Dr. Mzileni. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, former President uh, Tabo Mbeki, a man who's always been known for his uh, very astute um, logic and ability to keep clarity of thought and, 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 and focus in whatever he has to say. But as you probably would have heard the arguments against this letter from some, um, some have said that the same principles that he raises around the protection of President Sil Ramaphosa at all costs, or at least the appearance that are, or thereof, is exactly what happened with uh, former President uh, Jacob Zuma. And we didn't hear the same kind of cogent um, uh, you know, uh, rebuke from him at that time. And some may even argue that the ANC's caucus um, has been doing this for the longest of time, even under his uh, tenure, for example, under the tenure of President uh, Thabo Mbeki, for example, uh, with the whole AIDS denialism issue. Some have pointed to that. Um, is there any room for that kind of criticism in your thinking? Um, that criticism is, is incorrect. Um, it is misplaced and also it does not take time to get deeper into the details, to actually read what has been happening in the past um, 30 years, especially with regards to the literature that Mbeki has been producing. Look, President Beggy has been very, very consistent with criticizing uh, the ANC and how it has evolved in the past um, 15 to 20 years. Remember, one of the things we need to do when we read this letter is to also put it in context, right? And ask ourselves, who is Tabombik? Who is this uh, man? And two things I want to bring the attention of the listeners to is that firstly by the time he was removed or rather by the time his term came to an end in 2007 as ANC president by that time he had already been a member of the National Executive Committee for almost 30 years and as you heard the following year in 2008 when he resigned he said he has been a member of the ANC for 54 years So if you fast forward now to 2023, we're talking about someone who has been in the ANC for over 60 years. In essence, what does that mean is that in the modern development and transformation of the ANC uh, from 1980 up until this point, President Beggy has been central in crafting policies 
and the institutional culture of this organization called the ANC. And secondly, you've got to remember that um, uh, President Beggy has a very strong track record of building institutions of the state and institutions of democratic formation. For instance, what many people don't realize or remember is that he was instrumental in the building of institutions such as the African Union, institutions such as the New Partnership for Africa's Development, known as NEPAD. He was instrumental in the building of the Pan-African Parliament, and as well as increasing Africa's leverage in institutions of global governance, such as the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and the World Bank and the IMF. In other words, Becky is a global figure, a, a towering intellectual figure of international relations in the 20th and the 21st century. So when you talk about political literature over those two centuries, Beggy is one of those people that you cannot just ignore. He has been there, done that, not only in South Africa and Africa, but across the world, building institutions of democratic formation. So the parliament he speaks about, and if you just surf through the letter he wrote, just go to any page, you can see the vast experiences outlining in the active role he played in the formation and crafting of the constitution in the 90s, but also the building of democratic institutions after 2000 up until this point. So you are speaking about someone here who has had a strong hand in this entire democratic landscape that we see uh, in front of us. And he is so frustrated with how it has, it has been totally annihilated uh, by people whom he says actually could not even be in leadership. They are alienating these institutions from the people. They are destroying people's confidence in, in our democracy. In fact, they are making it entirely impossible for the ANC to continue existing if it continues in this path. So, in essence, he is basically telling us that people like President Ramaphosa, even Deputy President Mashatile himself, because he's, he had a very brutal uh, diagnosis about how incapable he is as a, as a Deputy President of the ANC and the leader of the country, even though the letter is returned to him. So he is actually an outstanding uh, figure of high stature that is busy now watching mediocrity taking place in front of him in front of South Africa. Mm. And this is at the core of the growing disempowerment and disappointment of South Africans at the moment. So that's whom Becky is. And people need to read closely to who he is and his track record and his outstanding contributions in all the institutions we see around us and his constant critique of the ANC itself since he became leader and even after he left, he continued to say, uh, to name wrong things as they are because he knows what it took to build that institution to be where it is uh, today. So he's one person for me who has been absolutely consistent about his principles. Sure. I, I don't think that there's any argument about the towering char- character of Thabo Mbeki, his intellectual contribution to the creation of the institutions that you've mentioned, although some may uh, argue that the success of some of those institutions has been limited. Um, My my, my question is still around the issue of the Jacob Zuma years, where we saw the ANC caucus do similar things in the protection of Jacob Zuma in a number of uh, motions of no confidence. I'm not sure, perhaps you could remind me of perhaps a... Uh, a moment where former President Thabo Mbeki raised his voice in a similar way that he raises his voice uh, around the protection of Sil Ramaphosa with regards to Padapad? No, that is actually not true because um, even under Zuma, when the counter judgment was uh, was passed, this was back in uh, in 2016. Um, he did pen down a long piece 
um, criticizing the ANC of using its majority to stifle uh, the executive from being held uh, accountable. In fact, in this very letter that he wrote to Deputy President uh, Paul Mashatile, he does cite um, that uh, article he wrote um, during that period. So there has been a consistent uh, critique of, of of the ANC under Zuma uh, and under Ramaphosa. He has always been consistent. He has never uh, dropped, the, um, dropped the gun at all. He has always been consistent. Um, it's just that now I'm, I'm struggling to find where does he mention the, um, the article he wrote uh, after the after Chief Justice Mohoeng passed the the judgment in 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 in, in, in 2016, but he did write uh, uh, he did write a, a similar a similar critique during that period. No, I, 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 in fact, I remember a time where he stood up to say why he will not be campaigning for the African Congress, uh, African National Congress, at a certain point in time where he even pointed out the fact that uh, monies are being used to finance Izengabi, uh to keep certain individuals in positions of power. So I think I would agree with you, uh, Dr. Mzileni, of uh, Tabo Mbeki's consistency in the criticism of the ANC when it mattered. Some have suggested, though, that there is beef, perhaps, <laughs> between himself and Cyril Ramaphosa, um, that uh, he is in fact the spiritual leader of the reason why somebody like Arthur Frazier would have gone to the uh, police at um, at uh, Rosebank to raise the alarm around um, the possible crimes or or fractures of the constitution that the president, the current president, may have committed, that he is, in fact, the reason why Arthur Fraser uh, went there. Uh, in fact, I'm referring here to, uh, to speculations made by the leader of the Economic Freedom Front, Freedom Fighters, sorry, um, uh, Julius Malema. What do you think, or, or what do you make of that? Um, it's... It's not entirely accurate, and uh, let me provide two reasons why I, I, I think so. Firstly, um, immediately after Zuma w- was removed and replaced with President Ramaphosa, um, Beggy came through as uh, one of the most uh, enthusiastic supporters of the new president. Um, I remember between 2018 and 2019, uh, he attended most of the uh, recognizable events of both the ANC and government that were being addressed uh, by Ramaphosa. And also 2019, he was highly involved in the campaign uh, of of the ANC for those national elections. So there was a, a restoration of enthusiasm to President Beggy back to the ANC after Ramaphosa took power, which is very different to... Uh, the posture he took um, between 2007 and 2017, where he basically um, stood back from the affairs of the ANC because uh, he said at the time, it seems like it doesn't um, resemble the actual values of what it was it was formed for. In fact, it has veered off uh, its main mission. I remember... Also, on the 20th of October, 2012, uh, President Beggy addressed uh, an O.R. Tambo Memorial Lecture at the University of and uh, in, in, in Alice. And this was about two to three months before the 2012 uh, Nongawun Conference. And that lecture is still accessible on YouTube and, and, and across the, in, the Internet. And it's one of, again of his outstanding um, submissions to the political situation in South Africa and the continent and the world, and basically exposing how the ANC even itself has dropped its stature as a leading force uh, in in foreign policy relations at the time. 
because it, if you remember, um, under Mbeki, actually, the, the, the foreign policy department, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs, yeah. was actually in the presidency. And that was the last time it was in the presidency, under Minister Nkosu Van Klamini Zuma and Deputy Minister Aziz Pahad at the time. So, um, his connection to Ramaphosa at the time, it was not based on friendship. It was based on principles that he believed Ramaphosa was pursuing at the time. And as soon as he started to believe that Ramaphosa is no longer uh, driving the ANC and the country in the right direction, he again went back to his consistency of criticizing the wrong things that he sees, even if they are done by people from his own party. What, in essence, is former President Thabo Mbeki's gripe at this point? What is he pointing to, and does he offer in his letter a remedy to the issues, the ills that he points to? He has two issues that um, he, he, he provides in the, in the, in the, in the, in the letter. And uh, the first issue he has is that he has a suspicion that the ANC is close to dying, completely dying. And his description of death in the ANC, it's not a, it's not a, your common dictionary definition of death, but this is what he says. He says, when the masses of our people finally lose confidence in the ANC as their own organization and dependable servant leader, our movement will perish and therefore cease to exist. So in other words, to him, it's impossible to imagine the ANC outside the, the people of South Africa. And once the people of South Africa begin to disengage uh, from the ANC, then that means the ANC is dead. So in other words, it does not need to die in the sense of it being completely deleted or being banned, like it was banned by the National Party. But you just need South Africans to distance themselves from it, and then that's when it will die. So he has that concern that actually he thinks we might have arrived at that point where South Africans are now beginning to distance themselves from it, and that is how it is going to die. And then he says, as a, as a possible remedy um, to this um, to this to this to this crisis, is that um, the ANC now needs to ensure that it has genuine caters rather than just cut caring members. It must take immediate priority actions that consist of specific initiatives and programs to deepen the renewal of the ANC. So outside of identifying how it is going to die and its imminent death that is nearby, he still provides some form of hope that if something could be done in immediate terms, uh, maybe the movement could be renewed and it it could go back to, est- to re-establishing that contact between itself uh, and the people. So here's a person, uh, a former president of this party that he built uh, in modern times, describing that it is close to death, but he is also concerned that its death uh, would create a number of problems, but he's hoping that something immediately could be done to rescue it, which I think for me... Um, is one of the critical contributions to political uh, political discourse in our time. In fact, this entire letter for us in the universities who teach in the in the humanities, it's one of uh, a good pieces of literature now that are going to be used um, as as material to navigate and interpret what is going on in our times. And I hope that people who analyze politics on TV would actually engage uh, with this letter and go deeper to what it is raising about parliament, about the ANC, about government, and how all these institutions interface and interact and their implications on South Africans. 
the ANC, as you've already shown us, has had many missteps, which former President uh, Thabo Mbeki has highlighted at each turn. And he has been quite consistent in under, underscoring the ever the ever dwindling quality or the ever de-escalating quality of the Qaeda. Um, he was very, very vocal uh, some 10 years ago about cautioning the ANC f- against career politicians. Um, he has spoken quite openly about the very quality of the SG of the uh, of the ANC uh, at the moment. I'm talking about Mr. Figil Mbalula, uh, s- stopping very short of saying this is not even a a, a, a Kada worth the name Kada. Uh, and as you say, he's been quite uh, scathing about Paul Mashatile himself. Um, some people may argue that indeed his sentiments are on the money but are quite impractical in the sense that the ANC of 2023 has in fact um, come to a place where it is irredeemable, um, notwithstanding the desires of somebody of the stature of uh, uh of, of Tabombeki and his background, but that the the coolest dear the kerk, as the Afrikaner would say, that this is an irredeemable uh, situation, and that that is the perhaps fundamental problem of Mbeki's analysis of the situation. To think that the ANC is in any way redeemable, and even the um, the the remedial actions that he calls for are impractical, however immediate he believes they need to be uh, launched. But they are impractical given the the atrophy uh, of the ANC at the moment. How do you respond? Mm. No, that is, that is correct. And let me say something about President Beatty quickly, in line with what you're saying. Remember that he's writing this letter at the age of, what, 81. Mm. I think he's 81 or 82 now. Yeah, he's in his so, 82nd year, yeah. Yeah, he's 82 years old now. Yeah. So he's very, very close um, to his deathbed. And with this letter, he is also doing what I call um, self-innocence. In other words, he's, he's basically crafting out his greatest pieces of writings about the ANC, about the country, and so on, for the sole purpose of ensuring that when he dies, his legacy is well polished. Um, So he doesn't want now for the ANC or anyone to accuse him that, okay, when he was alive, he actually predicted that the ANC is dead and it has no recovery. But what he's busy doing now is that for so long as he's alive and he's still a member, he wants to come out as a, as a, as a member who provided some form of hope that this thing can still be rescued if it can emulate the same actions that he did when he was a leader. So it's a sort of a, a, an, an innocent innocence making by uh, by himself of which the person the person next to me might say well it's a very selfish um way of of, of going about things at this stage uh, of 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 his life in other words this whole thing must die and collapse and crash but it must dare not mention my name as a people who contributed to its death which is which is virtually impossible because um his his time in the ANC and in government, as brilliant as he was, it was not completely perfect, right? There are also mistakes that he did. There are also areas of weaknesses where I think he could have done better. In other words, his leadership was in the public domain of everyone, 
and it was being tested, Aubrey, in real time, right? Like, he didn't sit on radio like you and me mm. to analyze what must happen with the AIDS crisis and how pharmaceutical companies of the West want to uh, suck out profits from Africa, right? He was at the cold front of that, uh, of that crisis. You, you and me are on radio, mm. sitting in our home just analyzing from a distance. He was there at the cold front of that problem facing those uh, multi-corporations who were so committed to come and suck out profits from the country. And he, had to, and he had to take decisions at that moment, at that time as a president of the country. So when we analyze him, we tend to forget that, that no, actually his decisions are in the public domain for us to analyze. Whereas us, as analysts on radio, our decisions are private. No one is analyzing the decisions we make regarding our finances, our families, our careers, and the way we lead. Right? So, the way we have to bring different political contexts on the table, we need to keep in mind that in the process of people fighting for justice, they also create injustices along the way at the same time. You know, and that is the messiness that comes with trying to pull a country out of an ugly legacy of apartheid. You are going to be scrutinized. You are going to be leading in a completely new terrain that you are unfamiliar with because it's also your first time doing it. And in trying to do good, there will be areas as well that are going to handicap you and where you're going to make mistakes. And that is part of democratic life. We put our heroes on the table, we honor them for all the achievements that they've done, but at the very same time, we also look at some weaknesses that they had and hopefully uh, hope that the next person coming in will take the baton and try to take us to a better direction. And that has been the story of Africa for the past um, 60 years. I mean, well-meaning, outstanding leaders Take, for an example, Kwame Nkrumah or Julius Nyerere in Tanzania. These two were out, far outstanding leaders, but they also had areas of failure. You get what I mean? So that's the story of uh, the, 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 the post-colonial epoch uh, in Africa in the 20th century and the 21st century, which we need to bring to the table when we try to read carefully at figures like Mbeki. I, I, I imagine that it would be unfair to criticize a Dr. Pedro Mzileni or even a lowly talk show host at night on the same terms that you would a president or a former president. Part of the reason why a president enjoys high office is because upon his shoulders are the realities of governance and uh, the possibility of being criticized at every move that you make. Um, I, I, I wouldn't even imagine, uh, Dr. Mzileni, that it would be fair to put uh, Dr. Mzileni on the same critical uh, space as you would a, a, uh, a former president or a president precisely because Dr. Mzileni is a private individual and the other is a president. So I would expect that uh, part of the expectation is to be criticized and to be scrutinized in the way that we do uh, those people that are in high office, including people such as Tabombeki and uh, in a- any other president, whether it's Kwame Nkrumah or it is uh, Julius Mwarimo uh, Mwerere. But my, my, Nyerere, the, the question though for me is, if the criticism of the ANC, Paul Mashatile, Figilem Balula, the institutional drunkenness of the ANC at the moment is to preserve a legacy, then surely that is disingenuous and deserves highest criticism. Uh, if indeed he, he understands the impracticality of what he calls for, does it anyway because he wants to protect his legacy? Surely that's disingenuous of the former president? Yes, pre- precisely. It is disingenuous. 
And those critiques need to, to, to come true to him because what he's doing, it's, it's something done by anyone who is in any institution and their term of office is coming to an end, you know. Um, you know, any vice chancellor, any minister, any premier, any any CEO, you know, um, they go on TV or they write a letter after they've been either fired or their term is about to end. They go on TV and then they basically paint a, a very rosy picture that locates them as the most innocent person in the story, you know. So it, I think it's a human function of mm. people who come out of those positions mm. that when, now that this thing is coming into an end, I need now to redraw uh, the story, retell it in my own way, where I will, as an individual, come out uh, as the one who is innocent from the whole thing. Mm. Others do it in order to have a safe landing on their next assignment. So if maybe my term as a mayor is coming to an end and hopefully I'll go either to the UN or go maybe to national government or I'm a VC now and my term is coming to an end and maybe I need to go to an international institution, I need to lay the ground so that when I, when I, when the plane crashes, I may be the one who has a safe landing. And that behavior is very, very common amongst people who are in these leadership positions. Mm. And we need to criticize it because you can never be innocent uh, in a political environment. You can't. If, if there's a crisis, you are part of it as well. Let's look at the substance of his critique. Um, <clears throat> re- regardless of his motivations, genuine or disingenuous, regardless of whether or not it's a legacy um a clamoring for legacy relevance, uh, regardless of whatever the motivations were. Let's look at it dispassionately and objectively and and check whether it is timeless, whether it's needed, and whether or not the ear that must hear the critique is ready to hear it. I mean, we've heard um, yeah. that... that that uh, Figilim Balula has gone back to the leadership of the ANC and admonished them not to make any public uh, statements about the letter until such time as they've met with the former president uh, and so forth and so forth. But let's look at the critique itself. Mm. What do you make of it? Should it be something that the ANC takes to heart? Should it be something mm. that South Africans support? Just objectively, forgetting now the... Uh, issues of motivation and why Mbeki has been writing these letters, whether he's been consistent or not. I mean, we could sit the whole evening discussing that. But just the critique itself, what do you make of it? And is it something worth taking Mm. to heart? Look, like we said at the beginning of this this conversation, the critique is brilliant. It is is outstanding. It is one of his best um, writings for me, like I said. It's there in the top two. And especially during this time where there's just cognitive dissonance from everyone who lives in South Africa about what is going on. And he has now come in to provide para clarity about what is going on, what is going to happen and what needs to be done. And I like how this conversation has went and I hope the listeners are, are following our train of thought where we say, Look, the critique is brilliant. Um, it's, it's what we need at this point in time. It comes from a person with a strong track record on these questions, a person with undisputed credentials in building democratic institutions in the country and the continent and the world. Definitely one of our best products as South Africa into the political landscape of the 20th century and the 21st century in the world. That is undeniable. It's clear, it's obvious, it's straightforward. Now, what we also want the listener to keep in mind is um, our, our admiration of this contribution does not also disable us from the other ability we possess as human beings, which is to say, look, 
irregardless of how brilliant this critique is, here are other weaknesses about the critique itself, uh, about the moment, about the person, about the time, and so on and so on. We must be able to do that when we discuss um, as South Africans. And I think for me, that is a very productive way of reading, uh, of reading things. Mm-hmm. So that's my uh, response um, to, your, to your question. And in terms of whether the ANC is going to act on the letter, look, to be honest with you, the ANC is not going to act on the letter. Um, it has no capacity to do so. It has ran out of time. It absolutely has no fuel left to renew itself. It is deteriorating after every single election. In the recent by-elections in KZN, it is collapsing completely. So it doesn't have strength at all to pull itself out of the curse that is under. In fact, it is heading south towards its death that Mbegi is talking about. That's the direction that it is facing. And the confidence of South Africans is now beginning to shift uh, to find an alternative home. And I can tell you now, the conversation in the country for the next five to ten years is going to be very, very interesting because it will be a conversation now about, okay, now what do we do? What do we need? Who now is our next home to take us forward uh, as, a, as, a, as a society? And this conversation now is going to be being had by people who were born during the transition, Mm. people born in the 80s, in Mm. the 90s, and also in 2000. Mm. So it's going to be a completely, completely different discussion now about new born young people, people who were were born during the transition, and they have very different expectations now about the direction that the country must take. Two or three points that you think are critical out of this letter two or three points that you think are absolutely critical for South Africans to take to heart whether or not they will give their support to the ANC as they did in the past or whether they look elsewhere I'm thinking also because uh, we saw the uh, Democratic Alliance has just finished their leadership uh, congress where John Steenhazen has uh, uh, won the position of leader, um, given the fact that uh, perhaps the youngsters that you speak of who were born during this transitional period might not necessarily hold to similar, um, I suppose, sentiments of owing uh, allegiance to the ANC for the liberation process, for example, or perhaps uh, people that don't have the same level of race-based politics that perhaps an older generation and my generation might have. Uh, what are those two or three issues that you think would make true the possibility of the death of the ANC in his mm. letter? We've discussed 95% of the letter now. Let me go to the remaining Five percent that <clears throat> people perhaps are also missing in the letter, what I call the mincemeat that is hidden in the letter, in case someone listening has not yet read the letter. I want people to go to the section in the letter where he talks about the outgoing CEO of ESCOM, Andre Derek. Now, Becky takes us back to the last interview Andre Derek had when he resigned or when he was fired as the CEO. I'm just going to read the first sentence, what Andrew said. Andrew said, says that there's a narrative that the state should control everything. Unfortunately, the ghost of Marx and Lenin still haunt the halls of the Chile House. People are still firmly committed to the 1980s style of ideology. Now, he says when he ends, they use words like limp and proletariat, which is ridiculous because these things were last said in the 1980s, East Germany. And when such individuals talk to foreign diplomats and foreign investors, people say we haven't heard this language since the fall of the Berlin Wall. What do these people think? These are the words of Andre, Andre Reiter. Reiter. Yeah. Now, 
listen to what Mbeki is, is bringing forth with this comment. Mbeki says, now I'm going to paraphrase him. Mbeki is essentially saying, we need to be careful of how racism operates in our times. Because what Andre, Andre is saying here, Andre is not making this statement to the ANC. He is not making this statement to government or to any minister whatsoever. Andre is making this statement to black people. Andre here is basically saying that sophisticated things like electricity, engineering, and science are things that must be handled by white people. Black people must stay away from these things. Uh, black people are pre-modern. They belong in the past. And you see it over and with the racists in 2023. They will say something very racist to you, but they are very careful about the words they select. So they will select words that won't make it obvious that they are making a racist statement. So they will avoid words like black, white, basically all the obvious terms. But the message being driven across, it's a completely racist message uh, that is being said. So Becky is now saying, look, as we move forward, there is a demon of racism that is beginning to show itself through, and we are so casual in handling it when it comes through. And when I told asked this question two weeks ago that, sorry, colleagues, have we not, it is apartheid in essence, a forgotten crime against humanity. It's as if now, apartheid is something that has been completely forgotten. And we have basically began on a clean slate in 94, and here we are at the moment. So, in other words, some of the challenges we face as a country are not challenges of lack of implementation of municipal policies. They are old questions of racism old questions of patriarchy, old questions that emanate from the dispossession of land uh, by, 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 by white people, by white foreigners uh, over the indigenous population that belongs on this land. And that question has not been fundamentally addressed. The World Bank last year issued a report about South Africa where it said, if you look at South Africa in 1960 and South Africa in 2022, it is still the same because every single category of life in South Africa has three major divisions. One, it's race, two, it's gender, and number three, it's geographic. Dr. Pedro Mzileni, I must stop you because we've run out of time. I want to thank you very much for joining me this evening and a very, very, very um, eye-opening conversation indeed. Much appreciated. Thanks, my brother. Dr. Pedro Mzileni, lecturer at the Department of Sociology at the University of the Free State.